talks about passion between the women and the men. Chris Dyer and his creative friends, darling. Ooh, 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 Welcome to another episode of Chris Dyer's Creative Friends, the super fun YouTube podcast interview show where me, your artist friend Chris Dyer, interviews all his super awesome, inspiring creative friends. Today, my super special guest is Kevin Ledo, one of the most amazing people that I know, a fantastic artist both on the canvas and on the streets, a father. And just a really nice, kind person. I've been friends for, for like many, many years. And uh, I'm really excited to make him a lot of questions and you get to know him a little bit better. How are you doing, Kevin? Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me, buddy. Woo! <laughs> yeah, no problem. Well, thanks for having me over in your brand new studio. You just moved in this week, right? Yeah, that's right. How is it? It's slow. Yeah. Getting there. Yeah, but we're, we're starting to make it functional. I mean, like it's set up now so it could start being functional in the next couple of days, but... It's really been uh, moving boxes to there so you can move things here and you know how it is for moving. High ceilings, man. Yeah. I could never even touch that if, if I tried. I have an 11 foot painting rolled up there which wouldn't even fit in my old studio. Uh -huh. So it's pretty, it's pretty sweet. Yeah. You were in uh, like on Saint Denis at, what, what's that place called? Vieux des Arts? Le Live Arts. Le Live Arts. And you were right next to La Brona when I was like interviewing La Brona and you know, it didn't work out that I could interview right after. So the time passed that we, we ended up doing it here, which for me is more exciting. I feel bad for Felix that, you know, is going to miss you and I'm sure you'll miss him too. Uh, what, how do you see the difference? Like say like in living, uh, like say like the, the neighborhood, like this is very mile end now, right? Yeah, I guess we're kind of like on the furthest corner of mile end you can get because like across the street is Outremont and then across the tracks over there is, uh, what is it? Mile X? Really? Yeah. Okay. So we're like the furthest top left corner of, of, of my land. But yeah, this area is a little bit of a no man's land. I'm not sure. I don't know what it's like yet. I just started. I just found a new cafe today. Uh, Looks very Hasidic Jewish. Though. It's very Hasidic Jew. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, there's there's like school downstairs, I think on two floors for Hasidic children. In this building? In this building. Okay. So we hear them running around and uh, yeah, uh -huh. there's kids always running around yeah, here. Yeah, very cool. It's a very busy street and a huge building. Yeah, you know, a super old building, uh, hence the high ceilings. Yeah. But and yeah. you're sharing the studio with uh, Turf One, AKA John. Labradette. Labradette. That's right, that's right. <laughs> nice guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like we've, we've known each other, maybe not as well as it, not as well as I've known you over the years, but known him over the years here and there. We hung out, said hi when we ran into each other and we hung out not too, a couple of months ago. We talked about both wanting a different space and uh, it ended up working out that he found this space and asked me if I was interested. So it was, it's closer to home. It's cheaper. It's bigger. I needed a bigger place because I'm painting a lot bigger than I used to. Mm -hmm. And uh, the live art was just too small for, for what I for what I wanted. I think they have eight foot ceilings, so you can't right. even compare like 12 foot ceilings. Right. You, know? you out outgrew it. But then at the same time, this ended up being cheaper because you're sharing it. Cheaper, yeah. closer, bigger. Awesome. <laughs> well, we'll miss you in the plateau, though. Yeah, well. it's, it's weird, actually, because I've been living in the plateau like my adult life. Like when I live in Montreal, like besides when I traveled and lived other places, uh, the plateau has I've, I've constantly been there, whether it's uh, like when I first moved out of my parents' house to when I came back from Taiwan to when I came back from BC, like I'd always end up being in the plateau. And I now I live in Little Italy, which is just outside the plateau. And um, I still have my studio. I always had like one foot in, but now it's like, I'm a little cut off. You got less excuse to, to go to that neighborhood. Yeah. Change is good though. Yeah, that's what I figured actually. I'm like, I'm ready for a bit of a change even though it's a little unknown, but it always ends up being a good thing. Yeah, cool. Well, I hope you still like come and visit us, uh, you yeah. know, at least you visit me by the it's park. It's the cultural center, so. Yeah, totally. We can go <laughs> and get some breakfasts, which is always, it's been our classic for the last few years because, uh, you know, 
if we don't get to paint together or be at an art show, we at least say like, yo, let's go get some breakfast at bagels, etc. when shit's open. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let's, uh, let's Hopefully wait. Hopefully that comes sooner than later. Right. We'll be having breakfast again. Yeah, fuck yeah. I love my brunches. So I always start these interviews by, by uh, asking the guests if they, if they remember how we met. Like, oh, damn. Like, I remember knowing about you before I met you. I think I first, the first time I saw your art was in uh, Skateboard for Series Skateboards. No way. Yeah. I was like, oh, Kevin Lado, he's Montrealer cool funky realism and uh I, I think i just heard about you through other artists and then i think we finally met at an in mass jam if possible yeah so the same thing i knew about you uh and then when we had that on mass jam i think at the palais de congrès was that the one oh, i can't remember we did so many that at this we, point they all kind of jumped there were like new blanches and shit like i don't right. know which one would have been the one but then yeah, we, you're right. it, it was almost so happy because it took like forever to meet you but then when i met you i kept on meeting you like over and over again the same week or something it's like whoa you again huh <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. i remember mitch uh, omen talking about your artwork before i actually saw your artwork oh cool too. cool and you were you were good friends with him right yeah nice well, I look forward to uh, interviewing Omen too whenever I go to uh, I haven't Toronto. seen him in years, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should be an interesting interview because he's got a nice personality. But uh, also, we got this thing in common where we both went to Dawson College. That's right. Yeah. A couple of years off from each other, maybe? Yeah, I think, he, not that you're older than me, but I, for me, Dawson, well, you're a little bit older than me, I think. Or I'm going to be 42. Okay, so yeah, I'm 41, so we're like very similar in age, but you, I did other colleges before I went to that Dawson, so that's why, you know, I did it years later and, and stuff like that, but we had similar teachers, right? Yeah. Like Frank, Frank Mulvey, Mulvey, Carmelo Blandino, yeah. who's like my favorite teacher, he's in my documentary if you, you want to see him. Um, I'm still in touch with him here and there. Oh yeah? Yeah, yeah. What have you heard from him? He recently emailed me to ask me uh, for my Leonard Cohen print where he can find it. So oh, cool. I thought that was really nice. And Very kind. You know, f when somebody you respect artistically right. wants something from you, it's like you're super stoked. So, yeah. Totally. Uh, he bought a painting from me when I just got out of school. He bought a really detailed, nice painting and I sold it to him for 150 bucks. At the time, I was like, oh my God, I sold a painting for 150 bucks. That's huge. Now... I would sell that painting for like a couple of G's. So I've been trying to be like, hey, can I buy that back? And he's like, no, man, keeping this shit, what the fuck? <laughs> but you know, he had cancer, huh? No. Yeah, oh, yeah. Shit. He was kind of like, you know, contemplating death. Uh, oh my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like last year. And I hit him recently and I think it's like done with. Oh my God, I had no idea. Yeah, but you know, he's modest and chill. He's, he probably doesn't want to make like a big fuss about it. But uh, yeah, cancer seems to uh, hit up a lot of people, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I love my, my Dawson years. But uh, so you went for illustration or for fine arts? I was an illustration. Okay. Um, but you're a fine artist. Well, that's the thing that's super weird is like, I went into illustration and design, but I, I never wanted to be to do commercial art. So why you study that? <laughs> I think like there was a part of me that wanted to be responsible like, it's not like I went to med school or become a lawyer, but right. like, I decided to do the <laughs> Let's do art, but the kind of art that makes us money. Yeah, that was <laughs> well, the idea. Well, that's why I went too. I first did fine arts, and then when I finished, it's like, what? I'm going to just do paintings, and people are going to buy my paintings, and that's how I'm going to pay my rent for the rest of my life? That does not sound like a thing. But commercial art is like, oh, but you can... Get gigs, yeah. you can yeah, make a name and keep getting hired. But... Uh, I mean, in the end, I'm really happy I did illustration and design because I learned a lot of techniques. Right. Um, and I remember looking at what they were doing in fine arts and being like, thank God I'm not doing that. <laughs> right. I mean, I'm a, I feel like I have a bit of a disadvantage now in, that, in, in the sense that like, when you study fine arts, you understand the world of fine arts and, the, and how to speak about your, your work better and, and, and you're, you're kind of linked into the, to the world. So you, you know people and, and it just like that expands, right? right. And so if You're you, I always, I always felt like I'm on the outside of the fine art world, even though I'm making fine art. I don't know how that makes sense, but like, unfortunately, I'm not like a commercial artist, but like my artwork is only sold in commercial galleries. Okay. So 
it's like those like fine art people don't take me seriously. Really? I mean, maybe they do. I I feel like maybe now they do. I've been doing it for so long because I do have like some fine art students. Why like, wouldn't at, they respect you? Because you sell at galleries? Isn't that like a not because thing? of that, but maybe because of the content and because like I would paint very realistically. Like I know like talent or or uh, technique was really shunned upon. Uh, maybe a little bit less now, but like, and I was all, I was painting a lot of things that were beautiful. Um, and and beauty was they were they're done with beauty and fine art you know they want to explore more deeper deeper things oh. and I get it but like for me visual it's so weird visual, I know it's weird like how can one kind of art be like okay this is fine art but if you try to do something pretty uh, no that's not not cool anymore <laughs> the that's movie. the problem of fine art though it's like throughout the ages it's like the the next generation the next wave of artists are always like trying to destroy what was there before. So mm -hmm. I guess there was a lot of beautiful art and for a long time. And then and, and the only people who had a voice in visual art were people who can had good technique, right? right? And so they wanted to rip that kind of hierarchy apart. Like, I get it. Mm -hmm. But for me, if, if you're going to do, I, I value art that has um, a visual impact, like uh, an immediate visual impact, but like also has depth to it. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a hard time with art that is, uh like i don't know a little too simple or or really not carried like it's almost like a bookmark for an idea you know like a, right. an artwork too you conceptual. look at it you're like too conceptual yeah right because it, it, it seems like art has become more about like what it's about and more intellectual mind uh you know the about than the <gasps> what what is it causing an emotion in my heart yeah you know yeah, and which is super interesting, right? I mean, it's, it's just it's, 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 different... it's academic, though. Right. Um, well, once again, it's, it's, it's for it's the mind. It's philosophy, mm. essentially, and 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 study of society, and what has come before versus what we think now, and 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 I get it, but it's not for me. Like, but at the same time, if I were to do, I f I f I could be wrong about this, but if I were to do certain, or at least I, I felt this a lot when I started doing abstract art, is if I were to do something in abstract, my audience might call bullshit they're like what are you doing that's so easy or why would you even do but i am finding uh, a lot of joy in experimentation with material and mark making which is something i never would have enjoyed before and that's right. kind of a little bit more in the art world uh, the fine art world right well, i don't know i mean we all grow as we go on and yeah no i think that's great like uh you gotta explore you gotta like you know try new things and now you're gonna get bored and what the fuck are you doing this if you're bored with what you do right yeah and and you know you know how I, I like I paint a lot of realism so I just didn't want to be just a technician because I you know often for years I'd figure out what it was I was going to paint and then on my computer and then and then paint it like as if I'm a printer you know like I know it's my idea and maybe maybe I did uh, the photo shoot of the person and everything but then like that part is fun I figure it all out I'm excited to paint and then I start painting and the beginning it's fine but then you're like okay day seven of like working on this cheek uh -huh. and it's just it wasn't as much fun and after a while i just wanted to bring more joy and playfulness back into into art right um is there like certain uh techniques or ways to go about uh say you were saying like you felt like you were a printer but you don't project for example some artists project their thing on the computer straight onto a canvas and then they trace and they do that and it's become accepted but maybe the world of fine art is not okay with that I don't, I'm not sure how big of an issue that is anymore. I know yeah. when, when artists, especially in murals and stuff, uh, started projecting, there was a lot of backlash, especially from graffiti, uh, the graffiti world. Mm -hmm. uh, I think now people, you know, like on, on social media, you'll actually see people sharing their projection. But now. on a mural, it makes sense because it's so big. How do you get the proportions right on a gigantic fucking building? But on a canvas? Well, uh, to answer, I, I do project, okay. not all the time. Um, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Okay. When I want to get something done and I want to get the idea out and there is a face involved, I'll just get the general area of where it is right. before I paint it. Usually when I paint smaller, I don't do a projection. So I, I with, will use tools like anything else. Like but the thing with you is like, I know that you don't need the printer. Well, I, know, I know, a, I know yeah. you could do it without the printer, the print, the, I mean, the, the projector. The thing is, you just want to save yourself some time and get going and not be like, oh, I did it without a projector. It's not an ego thing. You just, you know, you can do it either way. So might as well just do it the quicker way. But I was, yes, exactly. But I was definitely insecure about it, uh, especially when I was doing murals at the beginning because uh, 
certain friends would would be against the projector idea right and or people you meet and um and I, so i was a bit insecure about talking about that publicly but once i did like that giant 130 foot mural and without a projector i was just like <laughs> i could use a projector for the rest of my life and nobody can say shit because that was like 130 feet high and i did not use a projector like right. i can do it yeah I just You've decided yourself. not to. I just decided not to because it goes faster. Totally. Yeah, I understand. But um, but the fine w art world is kind of purist in some ways. In or maybe it's losing. I got like for example a friend who will design it on the computer, then it prints out like a canvas print, and then he kind of paints on top. Kind of right. like do you think that's going too far, or anything is allowed these days as long as you end up with a beautiful painting? Um, I guess. It's allowed in certain uh, uh, for certain audiences, and other audiences will t tear it apart. So it depends. It really depends what you value in fine art. If you do de value technique and the ability to, to to make something really nice with your hands, uh, then maybe people will be like, might feel like it's cheating. I personally, I'm not super stoked on the idea of, of printing something out and then just embellishing it. I think there's a lot of bullshit art. Like I've seen like in art fairs, like, um, and I, and I get the idea of it. It's like more conceptual than the final piece, but like somebody who made something like on MSN paint, you know, like a really shitty uh -huh. drawing program and then printed it out like, you know, six foot high. Uh -huh. And it's like, you could see all the pixels and, yeah. but it's like bad on purpose. They're doing it on purpose. Kind of like a Felipe Pantone glitchy kind of situation. No, it was like 2d really bad. Uh -huh. Nothing cool. Like Philip, Pantone has a, a, a cool aspect, right. right? Like there's something very uh, shiny and right. retro and cool, like retro cool. Mm -hmm. This is like, uh, this is, when you look at it, you're like, this is garbage. <laughs> <laughs> but like, that's the point. Mm -hmm. That's their point. Right. You know, it's like bad on purpose. And there's so many things bad on purpose in our hipster kind of day. Yeah. And what, what do you know is what's what, right? Yeah. You, they have a hard time. Everybody has a hard time knowing what's what. Like all fashion in the last like 20 years, are, it started by being ironic, mm -hmm. right? Like when most people started wearing mustaches as a joke and then it catches on as fashion or like the dad style, like, uh -huh. like all of these things, um, or, or what's it called? Normcore was like an ironic uh, fashion and then it became mainstream fashion. But like huh. nobody knows what's what because the irony is lost once it kind of goes into the mainstream. Uh -huh. Yeah, I understand. And skateboarding is the same. Like graphics used to be like so well done in the 80s. And now like the less you give a fuck is like, oh, here's a shitty graphic. We don't care because we're so cool kind of vibes. And I'm just like, no, please still do a cool graphic. But the funny part is that the kids are like, whoa, that graphic's so good. It's like, are we seeing the same thing here? Like, are they, they're stoked about it? Yeah. Or is, is, did, did people lose their, their good taste? Or maybe I lost my taste. Or maybe I'm just not in with what... Well, I think about this type of thing a lot. Like, I was looking at some uh, shitty pottery. I, that that kind of stuff used to be popular in the 60s and 70s. You know, when you'd have a plate that's not straight and... Um, like nice colors, like glossy, but like your cups are a bit wonky. And mm -hmm. uh, that was a thing back then. Uh, I don't know why it came about then, but most likely in response to like mass produced stuff. Right. right? It was like, more real and yeah, organic. And, right. and, and now that's kind of coming back. Like I saw it again and like it's kind of coming back along with, you know, a lot of mid-century ideas and, and, and design and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's always like it's, it's reactionary. So maybe like these kids are so used to seeing really, you know, polished things and they associate that with like, you know, like corporate corporate whatever. Yeah. yeah. And like. Uh, they're like, this is so rad. It's like DUI, you know, right. like, okay, and maybe that. that's the filter they're looking through it. Mm -hmm. They're looking through, but yeah, it's a, just I, a guess. I get it. You know, it's more like a vibe than actual intrinsic in your face. Like, wow, this was so well done. I mean, it's the same with graffiti. There's a lot of graffiti, uh, like people tagging and bombing with a really shitty style mm -hmm. and they're not interested in trying to be good. Yeah. or trying to you know have a good hand style like that's not even part of it they're like some of them want to literally have a shitty hand style like uh -huh. they want it to look like garbage because it's the whole attitude of i don't give a shit about your world and i'm here to poop on it yeah <laughs> pretty much <laughs> nice uh i want to get into your your street art but you started as uh 
as a studio painter, as a fine artist, when you got out of school, you did it for like years, you were in galleries in Vancouver and beyond. And I think at one point you told me you went to tai Taiwan. Yeah, I lived in Taiwan. So I, after, after I graduated um, illustration and design in 99, mm -hmm. I went to Taiwan, like I, I tried to work in the field of illustration for about a year. I did for about a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though I knew I didn't want to do it and, and I just got so disillusioned with it and I really hated it. And so I actually just like quit my life and I, I'm like, I'm going to do something completely different. So I moved to Taiwan to mm -hmm. teach English. Okay. How was so, that? That was really awesome. Yeah. I mean, when I see kids that age now, like doing art, I'm like, oh man, if I had started then like building, I would be so different now. But I, I've had, I had a lot of experiences traveling just as, as you have. It enriches your personality, thus enriching your art. That's the outcome yeah. of that. Yeah. So I was there for like two years. Uh, and the result of that is I've saved up a good chunk of money so that I could feel comfortable enough to try to do fine art when I came back to Canada. Okay. So I didn't come back to Montreal after two years. I went to Vancouver and that's when I started painting uh, and started getting into shows. And Did you live in get... Vancouver? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was how, in Vancouver for like two years. Okay, cool. I didn't know that. I was in Van... Yeah. How was that? Um, it wasn't the greatest for me. Like it's so beautiful there and I love nature. Yeah. Um, but I think there's two things that I had a hard time with. Um, one was that there wasn't enough sun. Like I have a hard time not getting sun. Right. Like uh, winters are hard for me here and it's a vitamin D thing, I'm sure, whatever it is. Right. So I had a hard time not getting sun. So I was always like kind of lethargic. And, um, and then the second thing was that culturally, it's just, it wasn't my jam. Yeah, it's kind of like, boring. It's a little bit, but it's not that it's as boring, but it was, it was just like, it's an East Coast, West Coast thing. Like we're loud and, and obnoxious and, and, and we're passionate and you kind of want to bump with people yeah. and, and they find that obnoxious there. Oh, yeah. Like I think I was just loud. I don't know. <laughs> so I didn't make a lot of friends. Um, you can't chat with people you don't know there like you can here. Uh -huh. they, they think you want something. Right. And I used to... Really? I would think like the West Coast vibe would be more friendly and open. And well, in the older people are mm -hmm. like... Are, you know, like bus drivers and shop owners and all those people are like super chill. Uh, but if you, like I found like with anybody in any kind of scene or anything that you're interested in, if you talk to them, they would just be like, do I know you? Like people yeah. have actually said to me, do I know you? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I'm like, no, dude, I'm just, I'm not, I'm just not, chatting with you. I'm just another human. <laughs> We're all like the same uh, human race here trying to be happy but that was a long time ago and i'd like to think that it's changed um after the olympics i know it's become more of a diversity yeah not, not that it wasn't diverse mm -hmm. uh, because there's a lot of asian a huge asian population there but anyways uh it wasn't my jam then uh, maybe but you started your art career there in the i started years. my art career there i eventually i went back to taiwan actually for four months after there and then came back to montreal mm -hmm. um yeah, and I just kind of figured doing my fine art thing here was better because I knew more people and I could just get shit rolling. And, and that was all around the time that we all met. The unmasked thing happened. There was, uh, there was a lot of things going on, right? Like we had uh, friends doing art shows in their stores. Well, and... there was galleries popping, you know? Yeah. Like, uh, you know, there was the unmasked thing that united a lot of artists and we could exchange notes and learn from each other. But there was like Pangea, there was Fresh Paint. Uh, it was right before Mural Festival, but pretty There's much... cover as well that brought a lot of this together. The cover magazine was happening and they had their own shows. There was just like shit happening. There and there's still, so there's, still, there's still shit happening, but of course with COVID less. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the street art and graffiti festivals of our city are having a more difficult time to be out there when we can't, we're not supposed to get together. Yeah. But, uh, well, you got your thing going by now, so you don't even really need to, like, even socialize so much in order for you to yeah, get the ball I, rolling. I guess. I have to stay active, for sure. Yeah. Um, COVID was a fucking huge bummer. I mean, I know it's a bummer for everybody. And I know it's hit all artists exceptionally hard. Um, but I, lo like, I, I, I make most of my living doing murals. Mm -hmm. And I lost, like, 16 contracts. Mm. So like I painted one mural that wasn't in the plans. It kind of popped up at the last minute this summer and that was it, which is like super weird. Yeah. 
but yeah. but I feel so very fortunate that people are into my you know my my studio work and I did a couple of commissions. It's like you're going back to your roots. Basically. Yeah, I never stopped doing it. Right. It's just I, now that's you're all refocusing I do. on it. Yeah. So let, let me finish this first chapter of your art career was the studio work right before the murals. Was the studio work like working out? The canvases was it working out before you started doing street art? Or, or was it that the street art just worked out so much better that you kind of like put that on the back seat of the car? Well, I, it was not working well. I was, I was barely getting by. I was always worried about rent. It was really hard. I don't know how many years, like eight years. It's hard to sell paintings it's sometimes. It's so hard to do that. Yeah. So hard. And I'm not, you know, I wasn't doing art that where I could get grants and shit. Mm -hmm. So I had a really hard time. And the reason I ended up doing murals is kind of, in a way, because I quit doing this. So like it, I had a big show in Vancouver and it didn't work out and I was just like, screw this. And then Josiane, my, my, my partner, we decided to, she was working too much at her job. We're like, screw this, this is not like good living. Mm -hmm. Let's we split to Central America mm -hmm. and we we're traveling around there and not working, I wasn't really doing art. And uh, I just needed a break and I needed to stop doing art. I was getting super negative around it. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, the, I mean, I painted some bigger pieces with en masse, especially at the museum. And I remember painting a giant face and being like, this is something clicked there. And right. I was like, painting big is really fun. And Right. Like, so, I guess en masse was your first muralism kind of experience. Yeah. Even though it was black and white. Yeah. Besides, you know, doing some really shitty graffiti when I was younger. <laughs> but, um... So yeah, I, 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 we were traveling. I thought maybe I could do some artwork for somebody on their walls in exchange for either a place to stay or restaurants. And, and uh, it didn't work in a, a couple of the countries. But once we hit Costa Rica, uh, Alan Genev was there. You know Alan? Yeah. Another uh, artist friend of ours. And uh, he was painting at a restaurant. And he's like, why don't you come paint the shutter door up front while you're here? We, so we hung out, I painted, and the dude loved what I did and then gave, gave us free food at the restaurant. And then it, like, there was a snowball effect where he, he's, he was opening, uh, no, his cousin had another restaurant and he wanted me to do something at his, but he hired me. Okay, nice. And then they're opening a restaurant together in, in like a month or two. And they're like, why don't you do something in the restaurant? And then the, the original guy's father and my parents own a hotel and they hired me to do two murals inside their hotel Sick. so it was just like i didn't plan it but it just like snowballed super quick and i was so negative about art and suddenly i was like super excited mm -hmm. it was super physical you know you're climbing you're right. doing shit and i was and you're paid like you do it and it's done not like you do it and you're like trying to get a gallery that. to like or like beg a gallery to show it and they might show it and they I might think. sell it for half the price. Right. So it was such a different experience and it just snowballed, like kept going. I was super excited. Every time I travel somewhere, I would just like, you know, knock on doors and ask them to paint walls. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not expensive to paint, especially outside of North America. Paint is super cheap and right. I would just do it myself. And, and you'd go with brushes, right? Um, I would. At the beginning, I wouldn't, wasn't even traveling with brushes. I just used like shitty brushes that I'd have at, at the paint at the hardware stores and stuff, wherever I was. Okay. So, but not spray paint. Um, not so much. I did. I mean, there was a bunch of situations like I did uh, when I was traveling in in Brazil in Curitiba. I did like a graffiti jam, and it was only spray cans, and mm -hmm. then. We did like two gems. Um, there's some murals that I had that are sponsored by, you know, spray paint companies. And so I did all in spray cans and I like it. It's super fun. At the beginning, I used a lot more spray paint than I do now. But I, I really like brushes and rollers. I do most of my stuff with rollers now. Oh, wow. Very cool. I would love to just kind of like sit there and for a few days and see how you do it. I would like to do more my murals with actual paint instead of spray paint because more sustainable, less toxic, you know, but I just, it's just so much faster with the cans that I can't even like dare to make it more difficult on it's me. It's also your, your technique is so specific to right. having like clean lines. The lines, you know, I'd have to almost change my technique. Like with realism, you kind of want that kind of like yeah. strokey kind of vibe, but actually works well with spray paint too. Yeah, you can. So then you got into street art through traveling, especially in Costa Rica. And then when would you say you 
came out of the closet as a street artist from Ural Festival. It's almost like when you did Ural Festival and you did that big face of that native woman, it's like, what, Camila Lowe does murals now? And he did a sick one and like, Everybody saw it and loved it. It's still up, which is unusual for a mural festival mural. Yeah. Uh, it kind of like was like a big banger. Like, yeah. ta-da, I do street art now. And from then you just went and killed it. Yeah. Yeah, super weird, right? That was like the, the wave coming in, you know? And I, I did the second year of mural festival. A lot of my people I knew and friends had done the first year. Like you had done it. Right. I know... Um, Actually, I'm not, I don't remember. Omen was on Omen the first was on one. The first one. Other, mm -hmm. uh, Jason Botkin, uh, That's right. Gaia. So I was like, and I knew the guys already from Landmark who were doing They're the They're all your festival. friends. They were my friends. So I was, for a year, I was bugging them. And I was in that time, I was already, I was traveling. And I'm like, I would always be like, look what I did in Thailand. Or uh -huh. look at it, you know, uh, until I was finally invited. And that was actually a situation where I had to use spray paint because it was like corrugated right, and a brush bulky. wouldn't work. So it, it was like a hyper real painting. It's faded now, but it was a hyper real face all with spray paint. Yeah. But yeah, that was kind of like, uh, because like there were so many eyes on it, especially like at that time, like Insta Graffiti, for example, mm -hmm. what they had like a million followers, but right. everybody was super involved. Right. You know, like they would have like 15 to 30,000 people like something. Right. Uh, there was Instagram was different then. It wasn't oversaturated with stuff. So it was like that kind of you could the really... people who covered it. Yeah, mm -hmm. like had a it had a huge splash. When I did my mural for Mural Festival, I had Instagram graffiti post it and also the photographer woman, what's her name? Uh, Martha Cooper. Martha Cooper. They both posted it and I probably made a few files and followers in those two days and i was like holy shit like they're blowing me up that's so cool yeah like now i can be a famous street artist it didn't happen but <laughs> i thought at the moment it would happen <laughs> yeah i'm happy it worked for you though <laughs> well you know it's not as easy as i wish it would be still it's still like a hustle that's for sure because there's just so many muralists and street artists out there these days that i, I don't even dare to try to make it in that world because like damn there's like so many they're all around the world and they're all really talented. So I'm just going to do it because I like to do it. But I got my niche and I don't really need to take any piece of that pie, really. Yeah. I mean, at the beginning, it, it ended up being like a few people rose to the top. And now, like you said, there's so many people. I remember I used to get invited to go to different countries more then than now because there wasn't enough of their population who would be able to do such large scale murals. But right. as those people had eyes on what you know, those big murals are, and they learn themselves. So every country has their own. Right. So there's less of that. Like I went to some really crazy places. Mm -hmm. uh, like Tell I went to, I country. went to like Bhutan, Bhutan. For, for a festival. That's like around Nepal. That's right. Yeah. And Himalaya. it's a very similar culture to Nepal. It's a kingdom. It's mostly closed to the world. Buddhist. Buddhist. Mm -hmm. um, How was that? That was that was what I imagined Tibet to be like before China took took over. Wow! It's uh, and I've never been to Nepal, but um, a lot of the imagery that I saw. I mean, it's it's. I think it's the same religion with a different leader than the the, the Tibetan. Okay. So they have their holy leader. Um, they they have uh, a king and queen. I think they have a queen, king and queen. But then they also have an elected official. Mm -hmm. Like they're super progressive in the sense that their king one day was like. We need to have democracy. I can't make all the decisions. So all the decisions now are made between him, the religious leader, and the, the elected official. Mm -hmm. So and you, you've traveled a lot through the Middle East, also, right? Like yeah, Haiti. I did some projects in. Uh, the first one was in Lebanon. Uh, no, uh, Jordan. Mm -hmm. I did a, few, a couple of murals in Jordan, and then I did a mural in Lebanon as well. Mm -hmm. How was that? Well, Jordan was a bit of a trip. Um, when I was there, because Middle East is a very middle, a very different culture, and but everybody was like, "This is Middle East light. Like this is not the Middle East." <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, but I got a good taste for it. The people are super friendly, but you know, like it's not uh, always my jam because it's uh, segregated men between w and women, and they've got different ideas about things. Not everybody, but where I painted in particular was um, 
uh, it used to be a Palestinian uh, refugee camp that became the second biggest city in the world, uh, sorry, in the country. And uh, in, in so they're Jordan? in Jordan. OK, so that area is very uh, conservatively Muslim. Mm -hmm. And uh, and where I was staying in Amman, you know, I mean, Jordan is, is Christian and Muslim. It depends on which parts you're in. Mm -hmm. So so there. Yeah. For example, like it's, it's, it's just uh, none of no girls would be coming out to, to hang out and watch me paint. But all the boys would. And mm -hmm. at least you blend in like you kind of oh, could, yeah. could look like Middle East. Oh, not, not only could I, I do. Mm -hmm. So when I'm in the Middle East, nobody thinks I'm a foreigner uh -huh. at right. all. Like I was walking around with my friend who is um, uh, Jordanian. Uh, we were walking down the street. She dresses kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. I know her from here, uh, Shermin. And people would speak shit about her to me oh. in Arabic. And she'd be like, what? And she would like rip them a new asshole Whoa. because they would call her an American slut or some shit oh. like that. Um, that sucks. But so, yeah, I blend in. I mean, even here, when I go into like a Lebanese restaurant, like they speak to me. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> they speak man. to me in English or French, you know? When I went, I stick out both because I'm lighter in skin and I got the dread. So they're all like, and I'm like, yeah, I'm weird. I know. <laughs> cool. You now, you, now you know that we're all different. Sweet. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's, it's, it was a, sp a special power actually to be in the Middle East and nobody looked at me twice. Because you know, you travel, people always are like, Bob Marley! What's what that, that person doing? I, yeah. So I was like, No woman, no cry. Hey! <laughs> and they're happy. <laughs> and they leave me alone. <laughs> when I was in uh, Guatemala and I grew out a beard, remember I had a beard for a few years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a big ass beard and people would be like, Bin Laden! And then like oh. disappear and be like, Fuck, guys! <laughs> Oh, man. Or they'd call me terrorists and shit. Oh, I used are, to get that all the or time. Or you look like Fidel Castro a little bit, maybe. Not, in, in that time, it, it was, a, you know, I guess, not that long after 9-11. So everybody was just like, mm -hmm. you look like a terrorist. Aww. And I was like, you can't say that. Yeah, that's pretty. <laughs> it's like, like, is that racist? Yeah, yeah. I mean, to think that I, what they're trying to say is I look Middle Eastern. And to be Middle Eastern, <laughs> to be a terrorist. Like, yeah. That is a racist. Yeah, you know, so it's thing. totally fucked up. Yeah, that's kind of weird. So where else have you traveled for muralisms or festivals? Like you've gone all over now. Like you got kind of like, you know, in a good rhythm where you got invited to a lot of things. And it seems like you're really good at like uh, uh, pitching yourself to festivals too, you know, like to at least uh, make a proposal. It seems like that's what you got to do if you want to get into a lot of festivals. No, of that kind like of every, I've, I've only applied to one festival that I got into. No, two now. Okay. Because you did a bunch around Canada, and I'm like, oh, how come Kevin Little gets them so, all? So yeah, in Canada, like the Calgary one, I applied and I got it. And then, was there another one? Yeah, I think in, Col not Kelowna, but in Nelson I did. Mm -hmm. But I think those are the only two, like I've applied for different festivals at different times. I don't put that much energy into it because it doesn't work. Uh -huh. When I apply, no one ever calls me back. So Nobody even responds. It's heartbreaking. So I don't do that very much, and I end up just, um getting get invited personally by people mm -hmm. that i meet like like in miami like everybody a lot of artists go there once a year not this year um and you end up just meeting people and if you if you vibe with somebody they're like come to my or, festival or, yeah come to my festival or mm -hmm. or just the fact that you're painting there i've had people i've met them and stayed friends with them and, and then eventually they're like hey have we'd love you to have a show in our gallery Plus, you got the skills and, and you show your work there. It's not just that, like, your buddy buddies. I'm but... horrible at being fake. Like, I can't go up to somebody and chat them up with a purpose in mind. Yeah. But, like, if we, if we vibe and we have a good time... Uh... It helps. But it's also because of the quality of work. Not yeah, just I, I would hope. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that's the importance of going to a place like Miami or Basel. So you go, like, what? Like, every year, pretty much? Yeah, I, was going, I think this would have been, like, the seventh or eighth year. Wow. And you, when you go there, I remember we've, we've done missions together where we like bought a bicycle and gone around looking for walls, but you've outgrown that probably. By now you probably go and like Same find shit. a decent wall. Nope. No? Same shit. It's kind of humbling in a way because like you have these ideas of yourself and your success and then like just sometimes it like it's so horribly organized there every year because it's always different projects. There's nobody organizing one whole thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And every year I have like two or three projects that fall apart oh. either before I get there or right when I get there mm. and then I end up doing something else. Mm -hmm. But I remember like a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago, I went and uh, all my projects fell apart 
and I was knocking on doors and I was like, can I please paint your wall? I'm like, I'll buy the paint and take care. Wow. <laughs> so they're like, yeah, I guess so. And uh, I mean, but in the last couple of years, you've been painting these schools. And in one case, you had your mural right next to Shepherd Ferry, it almost looked like a Shepherd Ferry collab, which is pretty big or it looks big at least. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's the raw project and there and it's such a good project with good really good people it's a really good initiative mm -hmm. painting at underfunded schools underserviced schools and mm -hmm. statistically it shows that you know kids do better with art around mm -hmm. uh, in terms of attendance the lower violence like there's so many things that happen when there's suddenly like art in the schools it's right. super interesting kind of like shows them that like the world cares so that yeah you know they're exactly. special you know and there's something to look at there's like interesting ideas to talk about they're in an environment not just walls you know like right. it's not less penitentiary style more like colorful ideas all around so art yeah is medicine so yeah it really it, it's proof that it helps mm -hmm. art, art is necessary so I've, I've done a bunch of projects with them in Miami a few times, maybe like th two or three times in Miami, three times in Miami, twice in Denver, Colorado. That's cool. Yeah. And, 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 you know, this is all a volunteer thing. And, but like, I'm just so happy to do things with them, hang out with them, see my fr artist friends. It's like a sleepaway camp kind of thing. So it's just a good time to like jam with people and right. have a good time. And in, in Miami, you hang out a lot with, uh, with Finn back, right? Yeah, so I met Finn in Miami uh, through Angelina Christina years ago. Um, I didn't... He's from Ireland? Yeah, he's Irish, but uh, has been living in London for decades. So okay. he's got a weird accent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's a <laughs> very popular realism street artist. Yeah, well, it's like more like a pop art kind of thing in a sense. Not not referencing like pop culture so much, but maybe referencing a lot of like uh, he has a lot of geishas in his work. He does like a very like uh, recognizable mask on yeah, all with of his the figures. Yeah, with the drip. So yeah, I met him. I met all kinds of people. Sebastian, you know, Squid called Sebastian. Yeah, and Mr. June from well, Squid from uh, named Sebastian's from Ghent, Belgium. That's right. And I was married to Valerie from Ghent. That's right. So every time I go to Ghent, I try to hang out with him a little bit. I went to his studio. He had a big, nice studio, kind of like this. And yeah, so he's always there in Miami hustling too. So yeah. it's funny. And, and I mean, sometimes you meet uh, people from elsewhere before Miami, but then you make the relationship stronger in Miami, like Paola Delfin, who I met in Mexico for a festival. Mm -hmm. And then we're all hang every year we hang out in Miami. And so, you know, we, we grow this beautiful family that we only get, you know, when we're all together is in Miami. So it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of a beautiful thing. Right. The and parties are great. The parties are great. It's too much fun. Every time I walk home, crawl, you know, I get home crawling, like ah. fall, falling apart from too much partying. Uh, and that opens up invitations for festivals around the world because you're hanging out with all these artists and not a lot but sometimes a festival sometimes an art show some you know sometimes it's a project in a, in a different place uh, the festival people you don't I, I find it doesn't happen as often as you would think because there's a million artists there and everybody's like a vulture on them and I don't even when I meet somebody from a festival that I you know, I know of the festival. I never go up to them and be like, "Yo, I'm Kevin. Do you, you think you'd be down?" Like, I never no. pitch. I never pitch anybody. Yeah, it's, in it's not very tasteful. To I, do that. I, I just feel gross doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, Shepard Ferry is always part of that raw project as well. Okay. That's why, like, he he did he did it there. He did it. Yeah, I've met him a few times. Mm -hmm. I was actually next to him at a dinner for uh, at the Winwood Walls. No way. One one time. Cool. How was and it? He, like, he what? recently bought one of my paintings, which is like. When he's one of my Shepard Ferry just bought one of paintings? He's like one of my art heroes since I was like a teenager, oh right? Oh my God. And so uh, when that happened, like just this year, I was just like, did that? Like I got an email and I was like, did that really happen? Damn, it's like man. so Congrats. stoked. So stoked. That's so cool, man. Yeah. Congrats. That's like an but, achievement, money or not. It's like, no, when yeah, it's a personal when achievement. When your artist peers and artists that you respect, like on your in such a way, it's almost like that's success yeah. in my mind, you know? Yeah, because it's like, you wish, especially when you're younger, you know, you're like, I wish I could do what he's doing and he's, he's doing the, the coolest shit. And then, yeah, yeah, super cool. Nice, props. <laughs> and then that's because of the Raw Project. Like I met him, well, I met him outside of the Raw Project at the Miami dinner, but like through the Miami Project, like he, we know we painted next to each other. We chatted a little bit about that. And when I see him there, you know, a little bit of chatting, so. That's cool, man. And uh, what other, projects have come about it seems like a lot of your projects are usually socially conscious like the raw projects about the kids 
and when you go to Lebanon, it was about women or something like that? So, um, well, when I first went to, uh, not Lebanon, but Jordan, it was, we worked with like uh, young adults um, on the topic of gender equality. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a hot topic for them, uh, right. especially for the youth and, you know, like uh, younger generations are often, you know, a little bit more progressive or so it seems, maybe I could be wrong about that. Um, and yeah, just to open up the discussion of gender equality. So I did, uh, one mural was actually about gender equality and the other one, there's sort of around that, but it kind of took another turn of like, uh, the idea was like, instead of waiting for somebody to make things the way you want to see it, like be the person that makes the change. Mm -hmm. And then in Lebanon, we worked with some refugee kids, uh, from a certain neighborhood and, uh, you know, Lebanon just time and time again has, you know, gets a beating mm. through, you know, a civil war. There was like, like bullet holes in your wall, right? Yeah, there was bullet, that was like a, one standoff of the front line that I painted. It was a building that wasn't repaired. So you could you could see where there was bullets and where pe shooters must have been. It's, it's pretty trippy. And, and I guess that ended in the 90s. And so like the kids we were working with have no memory of it, right? They, mm -hmm. they were born after the war ended. Mm -hmm. And but we would speak with the parents and uh, all they want is peace. And so that was about that was a project like facing the future. And we invited kids to paint messages of what they would like on the future mm, uh, in beautiful. the future. Yeah. Nice. And when you've painted across Canada, I'm, I'm sure in the States, you've, I, I've seen you paint a lot of native women, right? Women yeah. Men and, or um, kids and... That's right. Um, I just did one this uh, this summer in uh, Chilliwack and I painted a local s sort of she was a celebrity she she was like a kind of like a pop star Inez Lewis she was a pop star for a long time I think she won a Grammy uh, not a Grammy but a uh, what's the Canadian um, Juno's? a Juno okay um, and and but she's become like this revered woman in in, in town and she's a she's a nurse and she's she's like educating people about health especially during covid and helping her community she's just like this shining star for everybody and i was you know they the the woman of the festival recommended her and uh, of a few people and um once I, I learned more about her, it was just like, yes, this is it. I really like to have like a, a, paint somebody who's like, kind of like a shining beacon right. or the idea of something that, that brings a lot of hope and positivity. My public artwork is very centered around, yeah, kind of like diversity, inclusion, social justice right. and and celebration of diversity and, and, and that kind of thing. So uh, in Canada, I, I can't help but always feel an injustice for an indigenous people and um and so it's a definitely a reoccurring theme that i've done here in, in, in canada i've painted an indigenous woman once in miami but uh, i think most of them were in canada mm -hmm. well that's great because your style is realism thus painting people so if you're gonna per, uh, paint a person it's nice to uplift either a role model or community or a race or something to kind of like, you know, those who have been disempowered yeah. and make him grand and gigantic and magical and give him all this fucking yeah. power through the power of art, yeah. which once again is medicine. Absolutely. And, and some amazing things happen, you know, like I, I had to learn a little bit of the hard way how to go about this kind of thing uh, properly. Like I remember the first time I painted um, uh, Miss Chief Rocka, Angela Gladu uh, in Miami. I had done it and I started painting it and then I asked permission and it was like the wrong way around. And, and uh, she, you know, we got into like a big kerfuffle about it and I didn't understand at the beginning, but it's a, it was a long process and I definitely know how to go about things. It was a good lesson to be learned, you know? What did you do wrong? I don't understand. Well, you can't just paint someone without asking their permission. You really? Can't... Yeah, it's kind of weird. Especially and, and if they're it, famous or? Well, not just because if they're famous or not, but like particularly in like, you can't take a group who is, you know, um, someone from a group who is, you know, like um, had a lot of injustices done to them. And, and you know, like, even though it's almost like even though I'm kind of like the immigrant yeah. in Canada, I'm still part of the colonial world who's does whatever they want to indigenous people here. And so you got to do it tastefully. Mm -hmm. And it just makes sense to ask someone's permission if you're going. I've never thought down. about that. Uh, I just thought that if you do it, you're honoring that person. They should be stoked. But I never thought in my mind like, hey, maybe they feel like you 
once again took from them in this case that's their ex- image and you did whatever the fuck you wanted with that's it exactly and maybe it. they didn't want that that's exactly it and and it can be argued that i'm doing it for my own benefit you know like right. painting you're t- using for, them yeah oh, okay. and gotcha. uh you know that's never my it's never has been in my intention but i did learn the hard way that way i mean we're we're friends now um, I met her in person when she came to, to play. Uh, she's part of, uh, she's a dancer in a tribe called Red. So she, oh, cool. so I, she invited me to the show and I got to meet her and, and we're cool now. And then I ended up painting her mm-hmm. uh, in Calgary, like five stories high, like oh, a wow. giant mural of her uh-huh. and because she's not, she's from like a, a reserve not far from Calgary okay. in Frog Lake. So it was a hard lesson to learn, but now I know how to do it right. Uh-huh. Or I try my best to. and. And even when, like, when I spoke with Inez about painting her in in, in Chilliwack, I was I, just, I was just like, I'm I'm gonna do my best to do this, but like I fucked up in the past. Uh, I want her to know my intentions are are, are there, mm-hmm. and uh, the result is beautiful. The community came out. The ki- everybody there's like five languages on that on that mural. Mm-hmm. There's like I don't even know how, the names of all the languages, how, but like there's English. But then there's like four other indigenous languages mm. and they got to write whatever they wanted in, in, in a positive way. Hopefully so there's like swear words. <laughs> no, everything was checked. There were some elders there. There were some kids uh, like a lot of people participated. It was like a beautiful day uh, where everybody got to paint something on, awesome. on the mural. And, and it's important to get to keep that language going because it's like a, people think about French as a disappearing language here in Quebec, but like. There's nothing compared to the indigenous languages here in Canada that are like literally some languages only have a few speakers left. So, wow. so this kind of thing is like, I feel is like super important to perpetuate. And then they also had like uh, on that day when they're all jamming on the mural, you know, like the driver drivers by see that that's happening. Mm-hmm. And so it's a it's little bit of rec- it's it, inspiring. Right? It's a little bit of recognition that they're doing. So, you know, I don't know. It's just a beautiful thing. Nice. That's awesome, man. Um, have you ever had the, the case where you get the permission from the person to do the mural and then you do the mural, but they don't like it? It's like, oh, actually, I don't like those colors. I look all too pale or you made me look fat. Like, what the fuck? Are you here? No. <laughs> no? Okay. You're I'm lucky. too good. No. You're too good. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, I, it hasn't happened. Maybe it'll happen one day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think that would happen to me if I did it. Um, so if, if, if you were had to this, if I had, was to ask you, Kevin Ladell, what's your art about like what's the subject matter of your art like if you had to condense it in a couple of sentences or a paragraph what, what's your what's the subject matter or what, what's your art about what's the intention what, what, what's your so art? i think there's like it, it, my art is in twofold like it's studio work and 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 uh, mural work like public art so those are actually quite different even though they even have like they have a similar aesthetic look uh, the explorations are super different. So, mm-hmm. yeah, like I said, my, 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 my public work has a lot to do with like, uh, diversity, you know, sometimes environment, social justice, um, celebrations of people who've done things inspiring, you know, like iconic. If there's one thing that they all is, is that it all falls kind of under a, a iconic kind of artwork. Uh, in terms of my composition and stuff, but like when I'm doing things in my studio, it's way more about psychology. To be to be honest, it's uh, more about uh, perception, how the mind works, how we perceive things, and how we perceive ourselves. And a lot of it is, you know, like I'm really interested in psychology. So I, 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 I mean, I never studied it, but you know, like I, I, I read about it. I I listen to podcasts and interviews, and um, I find it, it, it eternally interesting to understand our own mind and our own perception and and uh, perhaps why we think things are the way they are or wh- why we think we are the way we, we think we are or what, what humans need as, as essentials and how they compensate for that and it ends up being part of their character. Mm. Like these types of things I'm like crazy interested in in my studio work. Mm. It's interesting to me that you say that because it's almost bringing it back to the conversation we had at the beginning when you first got out of school and the fine artists were in accepting you because they're so conceptual and in the mind and art is almost like a reflection of philosophy, not even of beauty. But here you're telling me that your art is like a psychological, mental exploration of personalities and the way they reflect. So it's really similar. And That's it's like, really interesting that you point that out. You're right. It's like a full circle. And yeah. Maybe if people can't see it, that's their own blockages. But Well, I just hope that because it's 
aesthetically pleasing, it's not dismissed. Like it, the contents of the art is not dismissed just because it's, uh, you know, mm -hmm. nice to look at. Right. Um, yeah, that's, for me, it's, it's almost like a no brainer that you want art to be pretty, like, or at least not run away from it. I don't know. It just seems natural to me that I want my painting to be good looking because I want to enjoy it when I see it. And when, if somebody buys it, I want them to enjoy it. Like, why should I make it not pretty if I can figure out how to make the composition appealing or colors harmonize or contrast in interesting way? Like, it almost seems like Especially a natural spiritual way of expression. And why should I block that? It's almost like humanity created all these cities that have lost that beauty for functions. Like, oh, here's the box, live in it, work for me and die. Like, okay, we're function and we're intelligent and we're making all these amazing things, but have we lost the soul beauty expression of who we are inside? And that's happening to art. Too. I'm afraid. I think that the people are afraid of losing the the topic of what is being discussed by the the shiny look of something that's beautiful. I get it, but I'm not into it. I I look at visual art as music or as a poem. Like like a song is is so much more powerful if it has like a melody that really catches you, and then you kind of dive in to the meaning behind it and stuff, right? But like, right. if it's just like uh, it's just meaning? feedback with a horrible, somebody who can't play violin, you know, and, and you're just like, oh, you can't even listen to it. You're not, you're not pulled in, so you right. can't explore deeper meanings. Or a poem meaning. that's not well, right. you know, constructed as well. Like it's not, if it's not clever, you know what I mean? In the case of music, like a song, doesn't have to be amazing musically in order for it to be a good song because lyrically it can carry it. But if the song's bad, I don't even care how to listen to the lyrics. You don't want to listen so, to them. For example, say like Leonard Cohen is maybe like, like not a crazy musician. Like the music's not this crazy intricate thing, but the poetry of it carries it through and you don't even care if it's just the simple chords, you know? Yeah. Or maybe in punk rock, it's very simple and dirty, but yeah, there's a vibe that comes I think, through. Yeah, I think punk rock's a really good example of that. It's, uh, and even a lot of grunge, it was just like such simple music, but there's a melody. Uh, there's a, I mean, there's not always, a real, there's always a melody. It's whether people like that type of melody. Well, Nirvana was the best one of the grunges because it was melodic. Yeah. Because he figured out how to bring like a Beatles pop with a punk dirtiness yeah and it was just like perfect for everybody yeah so talking of uh leonard cohen can, can, like i'd like to ask you a little about your most well-known mural in montreal like i almost feel like like you become a celebrity because whenever i say like oh yeah i got my, i'm gonna go and visit my friend kevin ledo and it's like, oh, he's an artist. Like, oh, yeah, he's the one who did that Leonard Cohen mural in the plateau. Oh, he's the one who did that one? Because everybody knows because it's this gigantic fucking thing that everybody's seen. But the funny thing about Montreal is that we got two giant Leonard Cohen murals. And that's an interesting story that was like in newspapers and there was a little of this situation. Do you want to go through that real briefly or at least your point of view of it? The, the conflict between the two? Whatever you want to share about that story. Well... The, the whole thing uh, is a bit complicated and um, we were planning on doing, I was invited to do the Leonard Cohen mural. Uh, Leonard I, Cohen is like a very famous poet, musician, if you don't know, who's from Montreal and he had just passed and they want to honor him. That's right. Um, and they, they, they've got permission from like a giant building, one, I guess one of the biggest buildings in the plateau, right? Yeah. And they had been trying to get this building for a while, but the, the owner didn't want anything. But once they presented, how about Leonard Cohen? He was like down. And he was Jewish, right? Yeah, I'm sure he is. And Leonard Cohen is Jewish. And Leonard Cohen's Jewish. And that area is historically Jewish and Portuguese. Mm -hmm. And I'm Portuguese. Like the story kind of, that's my parents when they came to Canada where they grew up. So mm -hmm. they, a lot of stories came into line. There. And Leonard Cohen lived around there, right? He lived a block away. Uh -huh. uh, I guess about two blocks away. And I literally lived on the other corner at that time. Mm -hmm. So, and we used to go to have breakfast at Bego Cetra, which is his restaurant. Yeah, he would always hang out there in the back. Oh, it's so cool. You ever see him? I only saw him walk down the street away from me with his iconic hat. Oh. Um, and I was with a friend who was like, oh my God, let's let her go in. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I never got to meet him. 
but so yeah, so that they, they they asked if we if I would be down to do it. The city of Montreal was super down. They were like ready to to put some money up to repair the wall and stuff and get like a proper budget because it's like a giant wall. You need a a machine that is sixteen. How many floors is that building? Well, it's nine industrial floors, but the, the floors are so high that it's like it's as if it's, it's the same as like thirteen stories because uh -huh. normally a story is like ten feet, yeah. and that was thirteen like a hundred and thirty feet high. Mm -hmm. So. Um, the machine itself was like 16 grand, you know, just to rent to the lift. For a, a day? For the month. For the month, okay. 16 grand. 16 grand. Wow. So you needed, you needed some money, but then, uh, so everything was kind of in line. It looked like I was going to actually get, get paid decent for it. And, um, and then uh, out of the blue, like the, the mayor, Coderre at the time, announces for the anniversary of uh, Montreal, the 350, is that right? 250? 350? 350? Canada, right? Canada is 250. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> that they were going to paint a giant Leonard Cohen mural downtown. Uh -huh. And everybody was in shock. Uh -huh. And I knew the, the artist who was doing it. I knew, they I, I personally you. knew one of them, and, I, and I've met El Mac a, a few times before. And, and they were going to do it and with an enormous budget. And, and suddenly, like the city of Montreal that was going to give us money was like, uh, we're backing off. We can't have like the city funding to, they didn't even know that that was going to happen. Right. So how did he feel when all of a sudden your, uh, your mural fell through? I was super bummed, man. Like, yeah, I didn't know how to feel. Like, I, I, I can't outdo Mac. He's like one of my art, her He's art heroes. He's one of the top. He's one of the best. Spray paint realists. But when, when after it was dead for a little while, and then um, Pierre Alain from from Mural Festival was like, you know what? You want to just do it? Like fuck it. You want to like we'll do this on a skeleton budget. We'll say fuck you guys. Let's just fuck it. Let's just do it. And I was like, let's just do it. So they got as much money as they could. Um, like the city, the Boulevard Saint Laurent paid for a huge chunk, and then um, a Jewish. Canadian Jewish Association, I can't remember the name, paid for it for a chunk and I took a really low fee and then we just were like, as, in my mind, if I did it before the L. Mac one, I'm fine. I just mm -hmm. can't do it after him. Right. Because you can't follow that one. I can't follow that one. Yeah. So we just did it and it was, the timing was right because the festival was before they were doing theirs. I like it. I like that there's two, you know. I'm okay with it. Yeah. Um, the, the media really tried to pit us against each other. They, they were trying to corner corner me into yeah. to saying certain Who wins things. the battle of the Coens? <laughs> yeah, and, and some people said some really awful things in the media about one or the other. Mm. And which sucked because I'm friends, you know, with yeah. <laughs> the artists. So yeah, we're friends in the art community. And I didn't want to talk shit about them at all. But anyways, that's how it ended up happening. I did my thing. A few months later, they did their thing. They're pretty far from each other, but they are, I think, still the the largest murals in the city, and they're both of Leonard Cohen. Beautiful. Well, good for you. <laughs> so we're coming to the end of our show. It was really nice to talk to you, Kevin. Uh, would you have some final like words of wisdom or advice for artists or just the world in a dark? You know, we live in dark times. No matter what our point of view is about the world, about what's real, what's not real, we all got different perspective. We all go from different outlets, but. Uh, we, I think we all want the same thing. We just want a world where we like can live in peace and do what we love and you know grow and have our families and not stress out. Like, uh, what's your point of view about everything? And you know, what's some words you have for us? Well, I'm I'm kind of like you in the sense that you're you're down more to just spread positivity and focus on the good things because there's there's a lot of bad things and. I feel like the, the bad things are, they get our attention way more than the good things. I mean, it's been proven with news and, and, and false news. It's like uh, if it, it outrages you or if it, it makes you, you know, makes you angry, outrages you or you want some kind of justice or whatever, like you engage so much more than if like somebody's like, this man donated $10,000 to the local shelter. Nobody, people are just like, oh, that's nice. You know, but like if it's something like they're doing what? And, you know, like, but maybe that kind of rage against the machine is what people need in order to do something to change the world instead of being so passive. Well, yes, but I feel like um, we're being bombarded with a lot of negativity and a lot of I think there's a, there's just as much positive stuff happening in the world. Mm -hmm. 
um, on a, on a, on a, I know like on a, on a small scale or different scales, there's like a lot of negative shit happening, but like on, on a grand scale, besides, you know, like climate change and, and things like that, um, humanity is generally doing better. There's like way less war. Things are always getting better. Yeah. There's way less war, way less child fatality. We're living longer. We're like, uh, you know, health is spread out throughout the world more than ever before. There's so many things that are generally better. We've got some major shit to, to work on. Um, I just, if there's anything I wish people would do is to, to not uh, choose sides so much and not think they're right all the time because it's always a gradient of truth. Um, and that's why different theories and things work so well is because they take a little bit of truth and expand on it. But like, to tell, to, I wish people would just have more of a critical mind and, and try to uh, diverse, diversify their information streams mm -hmm. and uh, be open to talk to people without um, casting them aside. Because mm -hmm. uh, I feel like that's the biggest struggle we're dealing with right now. It's uh, everything is kind of in a, a situation where the, it's binary, it's off or on, good or bad, God, the devil, you know, it's just so binary. but. In my view, it's just so, there's so many gradient, there's such a huge gradient and there's, the world is really a complex place. And, uh, and we need to, we need to like show love for each other because sometimes people turn on to one thing or another because they're not feeling good about one thing or another, right? And they, they, right. they find other people that will, makes them feel good about fighting a fight or, so we have to be nice to each other. Um, and then people will be less divided, I think, if we're just kind of realize that we're all like going, life is, a, is, is difficult and, and we all suffer a little bit. So we have to kind of, uh, instead of, you know, shooting from the hip, like try to, you know, take a moment and be like, yeah, I know, you know, I, I get it. It's hard. It's hard for us all. Like, let's try to all get through things together because it's really the only... Dif there's no enemy we are we are humanity right we got to try to understand each other and it's okay if we don't agree on things but it's okay if we have a conversation and agree to disagree sometimes as long as we all know that we you know it's all about love and making the world a better place and trying to figure out truth in the middle of all this confusion of too much information uh, so yeah thank you so much for uh sharing your your point of view kevin uh Thank you for your art. Uh, I, I could keep on going on and on about like, you know, your new studio work and going bigger and going more abstract. Uh, we could go on forever, but, uh, you know, I know we, we got to keep on going on with our days. Uh, you got, you know, to paint these paintings and, and so and so on. Well, thanks for having me. It's, yeah. it's always a pleasure to chat with you. Fuck yeah. Woo! Blessings. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for tuning in this week. I hope you enjoy this super interesting conversation. Please make sure to like, comment, follow, subscribe, share, etc., etc., etc. And I'll see you next week. Blessings. Peace. Next week, my guest will be Oresha. Like for me, reggae is like a spiritual heart connection and a heart connection. Like it's it's about one love. It's about like a universal love and like a, it's also revolutionary music. So I mean, yeah, there's I think it can it's very international at the same time. So make sure to subscribe, like, and everything else. Big thanks and see you next week. Peace.